inform that decision. Um, so to that, this presentation is in an effort to make accurate information accessible in a climate that's often full of misinformation. Um, so a little bit about our speaker, Chris Rex. He teaches biology at Ivy Tech. Um, he's experienced in doing educational presentations. Um, he earned his bachelor's in zoology and ecology oh, and biochemistry from Ball State University. Um, he earned his master's in biological sciences from the University of Northern Colorado. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. I just ask that everyone has an open mind um, and is respectful and that it doesn't turn into a debate session necessarily. So. With that, I will hand it over to Chris. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Bye. Problems they're trying to have fixed in all the new classrooms. So just on and off? <coughs> yeah. Right. Um, unless is that going to be all right with everybody? Oh, yeah. It's My empty. buddy is coming. He's running a little bit late, so he might get weirded out. True. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we can see it when the lights on. Yeah, the light, it's pretty bright. I think so. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we'll just run with it from there then. Well, as she said, uh, my name is Chris Rex, and um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about abortion because of a previous talk. Um, that some of the members of that group are here at the moment from Free Thought Fort Wayne. Um, they had Planned Parenthood come downtown to the library and give a talk about uh, abortion to some extent, but also some of the other things that Planned Parenthood does. And I, I think it was a result of that talk that led to this presentation because it was a little unsatisfactory. Um, it didn't quite address some of the questions that a number of the audience members had. Um, and fortunately enough, I have a wonderful wife that uh, hooked up with Lauren here and uh, managed to get this talk put together. So that's kind of where, you know, the history of this talk and where this talk comes into play just because we're wanting to look more at what the actual science says and what some of the facts are behind some of these different facets um, of abortion. This right here is a picture of my sister, funny enough. Uh, I did not take this by any means. Uh, labor of love just so happened to be at the hospital um, during my sister's last child and was kind enough to take some very wonderful pictures. Um, and this is one of those pictures there. Um, this is kind of something that I do tongue-in-cheek to some extent, uh, as much as I love and care for my sister. I do nag her to some extent that she kind of needs to have, stop having babies. Um, she is 28 years old, and this was her fourth baby that she just had a few months ago. Uh, and uh, I, I feel like she's had enough. Uh, she should probably uh, stop at this point. But um, then again, that is her own life, so uh, I just make fun of her as much as possible about it. So, um, with that, we'll go ahead and kind of outline the direction this talk is going to go. Um, we're going to start out by defining a few things first, as far as what is life, maybe some of the characteristics of life, uh, and then we'll get into some of the real meat of this presentation. Um, whereas we're talking about what is a fetus, uh, and then of course discussing a little bit about abortion, uh, tying that in with miscarriages, kind of defining the process of abortion, and then kind of trying to look at some of the myths and misconceptions that are often thrown around uh, regarding this topic. And then we'll start getting into maybe a little bit of the reasoning behind why somebody want, might want to choose one way or the other when it comes to abortion. Right? So uh, we'll take a look at that as well. And then of course you can't have a talk about abortion without talking about some of the legal uh, side of things. So we'll address that near the very end. And then I'll just kind of wrap everything up along the way. <clears throat> so, uh, to start with, just kind of continue from what Lauren was kind of hinting at there, uh, is that th my purpose in doing this talk is not to lord over people, not to uh, necessarily force them in one way or another, 
because uh, honestly, I, this is one of those things to where I, I, I have a lot of issue with the terms that are being thrown around with regard to abortion. Now we have one side which is considered to be pro-life, uh, and then the other side which is considered to be anti-life, so to speak, right? Um, a bunch of murderers and thieves, apparently. And then we have the side that's considered to be pro-choice, and then those that would just rather enslave mankind, right? That's not what we're talking about, okay? We're trying to break down um, these very strict terms and try to get at some point that's actually amicable and where we can actually all kind of talk about something without resorting to throwing sticks uh, or stones or something. So that's why we're kind of trying to get at the underlying science behind some of this to try to find some sort of, maybe not necessarily neutral ground, but at least some sort of firm foundation to stand upon. That way we can have a real discussion about some of these topics. Just going back to the original definitions I put in place here, um, the two sides, pro-life and pro-choice, those are really pretty limited definitions, right? So when we think about what pro-life is kind of referring to, kind of just referring to the baby, um, kind of ignoring all other factors in asserting that particular term. The other side of the spectrum, pro-choice, we're really just kind of focusing on the pregnant uh, woman and asserting that her choice um, is really what we're talking about. I kind of want to do away with those very strict definitions. I want to start thinking more globally um, because the more we progress as a society, as a human species, we're actually going to find that we become a lot more interconnected and that one person's activities really do kind of tie in with everybody else's activities. Okay. So we're going to try to get this concept that we actually work better as a community as opposed to working individualistically um, and just looking out for our own interests. We should be considering other people's interests and points of view as well. So, just to break down um, one of these particular sides, the pro-life side, so to speak, um, as a biologist, I always kind of cringe when I hear the, the term pro-life because clearly they didn't take the same biology class I did um, when it came to pro-life because when I think about life, I think about everything in the universe being broken down into two different things. That is, abiotic factors, or those things that are non-living, like rocks and such, or those things that are actually living, the biotic factors, so to speak. So that's everything we consider to be uh, living animals, plants, everything like that. The thing is, is that when we come to defining what makes a living thing, we do have some characteristics that we consider to be very, very important for defining that. Okay. First off, it has to be able to use energy to some degree and have some sort of metabolism to be able to do things that will maintain its living state. Because if you can't maintain homeostasis with your, with your environment, then you die. Pretty straightforward equation. You also have to be able to respond to your external environment in order to maintain homeostasis in the first place. You also have to grow and reproduce. And you tend to be consisting of a simple unit. And that unit we call cell. Lots of cells together form a population at which they can actually evolve. Okay, so that's where we start throwing in evolution. So when it comes from a strict definition of life perspective, we start to see a very, very broad scope here. Now, a lot of different things can be considered life. And that narrowing the pro-life side down to just the child, just the fetus, um, is a little short-sighted, to say the least. Okay. So I'm going to kind of take this one step further here, related to the actual talk at hand, and talk about uh, kind of what, what the fetus goes through when it's developing. Right, so first off, you have the very simple act of uh, coitus, where you end up having um, basically the injection of sperm into the female, after which it goes on its grand journey. Okay, it not only has to make its way from uh, the vagina to the uterus through the cervix, but it then has to go from the uterus all the way up through the fallopian tube, up here into this little arm right here, which you call the ampulla the fallopian tube. Okay, so he has to come all the way through this entire route in order to just meet this egg and fertilize it. That's quite a journey. Okay, 
this is part of the reason why it takes millions of sperm to fertilize uh, a female. Just because that entire journey is not only long and arduous, but it's very, very dangerous. Inside of a, of a woman is hostile. Uh, <laughs> You don't know. We're, we're going to let, let that go at that. Um, <laughs> before I get something thrown at me. Uh, okay, so, so once that sperm connects with that egg and they unite and form a zygote, at that point we can start referring to that zygote as a conceptus. Right. So we'll, we'll throw this term around a little bit here. Um, just note that there is a whole lot of different ways that we can refer to this particular uh, cell at this particular juncture. So you can refer to it as conceptus, zygote, and oh, we can even break it down um, a little bit further here. Uh, we can start referring to it as a blastocyst. Um, at some point, once it starts dividing and making its way back to the uterus, um, and that's when we start really coming at a different type of scenario. Okay, so he kind of makes his way back down to the uterus. Uh, and hopefully ends up implanting into the endometrial wall of the uterus. In order to do that, he basically has to kind of erode away some of the lining here in order to basically create a giant pool of blood. Right, it's a little barbaric, um, but he's doing this because of something that we call the placental barrier. Right, it's kind of similar to the blood-brain barrier in that it's it's designed to try to minimize the amount of crossover of contaminants between mother and child. And in this particular case, we're really concerned about the blood portion. We don't necessarily want the blood of the mother and the child mixing because they very well could be two different blood types, two very hostile blood types that might actually react to one another, uh, resulting in the loss of the child or uh, bad things happening to the mother as well. So, once we get to that stage, we start to see an extra level of development where we establish this placental barrier. We start growing uh, something that we call the umbilical cord to kind of interface between the child and the mother in a way that's indirect. So we kind of have some of the, the fetal circulation coming out here. It's exchanging nutrients, oxygen, things of that nature with the mother, but they're doing it with kind of a wall between them, just to maintain that, that level of separation between the two. There are a couple other structures labeled on here I'm not going to talk too much about. Um, but yeah, so we start to have the development of what we call an embryo at this stage. Once it implants into the wall of the uterus, we consider it to be an embryo until about week eight. Okay. During this time, we have a few different things, developmental things happening here. Like I said, the, the placenta forms, we start getting the amniotic sac, um, and then we start seeing some other features that become a lot more familiar to us. Uh, that'll actually show here on another uh, slide in the future. But we start to see a little bit of a face. Um, we even start to see a little bit of a heartbeat at this particular juncture. Now, theoretically speaking, you can't easily detect that heartbeat. Um, it's not very strong at this point. But we do end up seeing it just a little bit before we stop calling it an embryo. Okay, so the embryo we can detect a heartbeat in. Now, we do see a little bit of development in other areas here. Uh, just looking at some of the other auxiliary structures of the fetus, so to speak, or of the embryo, I should say. And then we finally reach the fetus stage. And that we call a fetus all the way up until it's born. So, start out with the embryo. Then we have the, the fetus, and that's where we really start seeing those significant developmental changes. Okay, so after about two months, you start seeing a whole lot of things happening. You, know, you start seeing behaviors, you start seeing very, very uh, specific structures forming, uh, and even fully forming to some degree. Uh, we actually have a, a, a circulatory system that's functional, urinary system that's functional, um, and we even get to uh, uh, determine the gender by this point. So that's kind of nice. Um, we can actually start seeing a lot of things um, by around uh, 16 weeks. Now, if the fetus makes it to a 16-week point, that's when it really becomes more or less safe, so to speak. Okay? Uh, because after that point, we really see the chances of a miscarriage dropping significantly. Okay? So 
If this baby was to miscarry, it would have miscarried by now, by the time we reached the 16th week point. Uh, I think I already kind of mentioned that. Um, by about 20 weeks, it's actually pretty active. Um, that's when the mother can start detecting a uh, significant amount of movement inside her. Uh, and we also start to see hair, if we're looking at an ultrasound or something. Um, actually see that developing on the head. And then we reach about 24 weeks when the fetus can actually survive with substantial aftercare, um, if it was to be prematurely born at that point. Um, and in fact, I think the earliest we've ever been able to do that um, is 22 weeks. So uh, it seems to be kind of a a definitive cutoff point uh, for us being able to actually take a baby that's born that premature and care for it uh, in the external environment. Otherwise, it needs to be in the mother um, uh, before then. Interesting thing about 24 weeks, though, the fetus can start responding to external stimuli, which is, of course, important for it being outside the mother in the first place. Uh, but it is kind of interesting that they can hear to some degree and respond uh, to some of the sounds that they have. You also start to see the eyes opening at this stage. Um, once again, if you uh, look at a, an ultrasound, now this, this is not a, a very good ultrasound here. This is kind of a profile view, just kind of showing the head, um, which starts to become real, real obvious around 28 weeks when it really starts ballooning in size. Um, you can start to see the cranium really developing, uh, those eyes really developing, um, and when the fetus itself becomes not only responsive to sound, but also to light uh, and uh, uh, pain, so to speak. Kind of About 32 weeks, that's when it starts developing even more, um, most notably developing the brain portion, uh, just because us as humans, man, we just we have such enormous brains. Uh, about three times the size of our closest primate ancestors. It's really quite incredible. So we really have to put a lot of energy towards building that massive noggin um, just to give the woman a heck of a time on the way out. Uh, that's where all the problems occur, so to speak. Um, let me see, what else was I saying? Oh, okay. So what's nice about 32 weeks is that we can actually start reaching the point where if it's born premature at that stage, we don't necessarily need extensive care, uh, you know, a ventilator or whatever. We don't need that to take care of the baby at that stage. It's kind of cool. It can start living on its own uh, without any aid, so to speak. And then, of course, at 36 weeks, that's when it's really more or less ready to come out. Okay. Um, and so you'll start seeing everything finish up. Uh, the last thing to really finish is the lungs. For some reason or other, the lungs are... Uh, kind of the number one thing that has to finish up before the baby can really survive without any aid. And that's why so many premature babies have issues breathing, have to be put in uh, some sort of special environment, um, just because of that being the last thing that happens. Um, oh yes, okay, so I did mention that. The lung surfactant levels are actually what signals the fetus to come out or signals the fetus to signal the mother to come out. Okay. So the mother will not necessarily undergo the process of labor unless she receives a signal from the fetus that says, hey, I can breathe in the outside world. Let's get this thing moving. This process is called parturition, the whole process of being born, so to speak. Um, going to find that just because we'll talk about it a little bit more again later. And of course, you can see how happy the baby is once it actually comes out uh, uh, and gets its head crushed by uh, that whole area. <laughs> uh, okay, so now that we kind of know the life stages, we can talk about what abortion is. Get to uh, really kind of the topic of the talk here. There are a couple different definitions that we have to define and lay out first. First off, you can use uh, a nice definition here that I really enjoyed. Abortion is the surgical or medical termination of pregnancy. Okay. All right, that's, that's reasonably specific. Um, but specifically, even more so, we can talk about pregnancy not being carried to term. 
which is to say it's not carried uh, through to this 37 to 42 week time period. That's kind of what we consider to be term, so to speak. Pregnancy can be defined as being the period from conception to birth. All right, that seems simple enough. But what's conception? That's where we start getting a little bit more vague, so to speak. Okay. Because some people define conception as being the moment that the sperm and egg fertilize, that they unite and come and join together. Other people consider it the moment that they implant into the wall of the uterus. Or some assert that both of those things have to happen. Okay. So we get a little bit of confusion here at the conception stage. A little bit strange thing. The other thing that we have to define is miscarriage. And some people define miscarriage as being a form of spontaneous abortion. Now, generally speaking, just going back to kind of what I was saying earlier, um, generally speaking, we consider miscarriage to happen in the first 20 weeks. Because beyond that, it's pretty much cemented in place. The baby's going to survive uh, short of any significant trauma um, coming to the mother or the, the pregnant woman. Oh, and I guess I was just showing, uh, once again, another picture of my sister, because she's a great model for uh, everything related to babies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so going to miscarriages, about 20% of all pregnancies end in miscarriage, which is pretty high. I, I was honestly a little surprised once I actually I sat down and looked that up a little bit more. Um, obviously, it's going to be smaller of a percentage chance in younger folk, uh, younger women, and then larger chance in older women. Uh, we actually, let's see, did I say it here? Oh yeah, I did. Uh, actually raises to about 50% in women over 45. Okay, um, and that's because you're really reaching the upper limit for women having children in the first place. I think last figure I saw was the oldest mother being 56, if I remember correctly. Um, so that's kind of why that skyrockets at that level. And that's because it, it starts involving a lot of chromosomal abnormalities and the fetus just uh, can't make it through the, the cell checkpoints at that, at that stage. Now, if we're talking about our 20% though, about three quarters of those are what we call chemical miscarriages. And that's to say that basically after implantation occurs, it's not long before that fetus is aborted. Right? And just kind of... Um, flushed out of the mother along with the normal menstrual blood, and honestly, there are a number of times where the mother doesn't even realize anything happened. Okay. It may just seem to be her next, um, her next period, and no harm, no foul, so to speak. Um, and she never realized that she was actually pregnant during that time period. And like I said, during the first trimester here, we're pre predominantly talking about chromosomal abnormalities of some sort. Now, we can also look at a variety of other factors here, referring to the mom. Like I said, age is definitely a significant factor. Also trauma, of course. But even some other more benign things, like uh, maybe just the health of the individual, or her lifestyle, you know, if she smokes, if she drinks, things of that nature. All that can play into this. So it's really kind of dependent on the mother and what she's doing as far as her chances for miscarriage um, for the baby. Now, some other things that I kind of like to mention just briefly, because this can be a question that some people have, is that there's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing to go to work while you're pregnant. Okay? It's not necessarily a bad thing um, to continue having sex while you're pregnant, um, or undergoing moderate exercise even. That's okay. It's okay. You just got to be smart about it, and you'll be fine. Um, those things have been shown to negatively impact uh, a pregnancy, per se. However, having a miscarriage does seem to have a small impact on future pregnancies. Okay, we do see maybe a slight increase by about 5% or so uh, in your chances of having another miscarriage after that first one. Uh, I think I already kind of mentioned that. Um, if you make it through the first semester, then you tend to be pretty good, uh, pretty good to go. But the problem is here is that the longer that a fetus goes 
past that first trimester without miscarrying, the more dangerous it becomes for the mother. Right? And so we have to keep that in mind when it comes to considering aftercare. Especially in today's modern age, I mean, we're, we're getting on this homeopathic kick, I don't know why. Um, it makes me slam my head into the wall at night sometimes. But uh, we're getting to this part where, to this point where we're, we're going back to what's more natural. And just because a mother can deal with a miscarriage by herself does not necessarily mean that that is the best thing to do or that's in her best interest or in her kid's best interest. Okay. Because the longer she goes um, before having that miscarriage, the greater her chances of having an infection or hemorrhaging as a result of that miscarriage. Okay. So we have about half of miscarriages having to resort to some sort of <coughs> DNC procedure, which is basically standing for dilation uh, and curatage. Now, dilation is pretty obvious, dilating cervix, whatever. Um, that just kind of helps open up the portal, so to speak, so we can just kind of um, get those materials out. But the curatage is a little, I almost want to say, a little more direct of a response. Because okay? here we're talking about inserting a tool. Uh, here I have a few of them lined up for you, uh, different sizes, slightly different purposes here. And these are basically precision surgical instruments that are used to help scrape out um, some of the remains of this miscarriage if it didn't all come out on its own. Okay. Because if that stuff remains in there, it can easily start to get an infection and cause sepsis, which can result in the death of the mother. So we have to get that material out. So we can use these, these tools right here to kind of scrape away at that uterine wall um, get some of that material out, that way it's nice and safe for the mother. Then we can give her a um, nice little wash up with some uh, antibacterial solution or something. We can also get to the point where we utilize suction during this process. Um, once again, just helps to collect the material uh, in a very safe way um, that helps collect everything out of it. Flush it all out. Now, this is a great option. Um, it's definitely been improving in its utility over the years. Uh, un unfortunately, if you go online and try to look up some of this stuff, um, you'll see some very old tools that were used for this procedure that look very, very medieval. Um, you know, they, some, sometimes they'll look like a, a, a spoon that was, has these giant serrated edges as if we're just going in and like scooping out chunks of flesh um, from the inside of the female, and that's just not the case. Um, but there are some risks associated with DNC. Uh, we do have a 16% chance to scar the uterus or cervix, and um, it actually could impact fertility potentially uh, through the scarring. Now, of course, there is a possibility that we can go in and rip out some of the scarring um, and repair some of that tissue, but there is a small chance of that happening uh, along the way. Now, we do have a study here. I'm just kind of throwing up here just to throw some numbers at you. Uh, this will be the first of a number of different studies that I kind of look through and present for you. In this particular study, they were looking at 5,400 different times um, that this DNC had been performed on different women. And what they saw was that about 103 of these women had complications with this procedure. Right. So about 2% of all the women had some sort of complication, whether it was perforating the uterus, um, poking the side walls, having hemorrhage, or some sort of lacerations. Of course, they also found a correlation here with a retroverted uterus, just to say that the uterus actually tilts backward as opposed to forward. Typically, the uterus tilts forward towards the belly button. Um, a retroverted uterus actually tilts backward towards the spine. And that can actually result in complications along the way. But, so there it is, 2%. Seems pretty nominal to me. Um, but there it is. It's, there are some def definitely uh, some risk factors there. Now, there are also cases where you have recurrent, oh yes. 
So these are things that doctors do when a woman comes in and says, I just had a miscarriage. Then they start use, doing the DNC to make sure that she is um, not as great of a risk of infection and hemorrhaging. So what they would do is they would do a number of different tests to assert if that was needed, right? Okay. Um, this is definitely one of the things they could do is an ultrasound to see if there is some significant leftover material uh, and if it is going to result in a problem. Uh, obviously they can also go in just with a camera, um, kind of like a uh, uh, hysteroscopy I think it's called, and physically look around inside there and see if that is something that's warranted. Because honestly, they're trying to move away from this procedure a little bit. Because uh, yes, it is a little bit more barbaric, but um, they're, they're trying to get away from so much of the scraping because of some of these issues that they're having here. Uh, so if they can avoid it, um, they will certainly try. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, so yeah, you can have a uh, miscarriage a number of different times in a row. Um, if you hit about the number three or so, we consider you to be uh, a recurrent miscarriage. Right? That happens about 1% of the time. Funny enough, it happened in my sister. Um, once again, 28, she has four girls, uh, and she has had four miscarriages. Okay. Um, so very interesting. This is a, a, an ultrasound of one of her miscarriages. Uh, I can't remember how many weeks long this was. Not, not many, I'll tell you that much. Um, but yeah, so you can just see a little bit of the dude here, a little bit there. Um, so very quickly after these pictures were taken, uh, her body uh, uh, miscarried that child. Now, we can consider this whole process of miscarriage to be a form of natural selection. Because, like I said, predominantly speaking, we're talking about chromosomal abnormalities. It's some sort of genetic defect that the fetus is picking up on as it's developing as an embryo and it's saying, you know what, this is not going so well, uh, let's just stop what we're doing uh, and call it good. So we can consider that to be a nice little self-selecting process there. Now medically speaking, we can actually tie in the term abortion to refer to any stoppage in the pregnancy by any means, including a natural means. So theoretically, according to the medical definition of the term, abortion refers to both elective abortions and miscarriages. Oh, and it, it's kind of all about this right here. If the baby can survive outside of the mother, um, uh, then we consider it to be kind of the, the upper limit to that definition. Uh, okay, getting down to how they're physically performed and how they kind of work along the way if we're looking at abortion. We can look at two different things. We have a medical abortion, which is typically done in the first nine weeks or so, um, just because we're, we're, we're talking about a situation where you can just take a few drugs and they will uh, enable you to abort the fetus pretty easily, uh, so to speak, um, and without surgery. Okay. So we have a couple different drugs here. We have um, uh, misoprostol, which is basically what helps your uterus actually undergo contractions, so you can kind of uh, pump, uh, pump out the placenta and the embryo. Also dilates your cervix, otherwise they would just kind of sit up there in the uterus. Also have an option here where we have methotrexate combined with um, uh, the mesoprostol just because we need to still be able to dilate the cervix, we still need to uh, get that uterus to contract, but the whole point of methotrexate is to actually stop the cell division within the embryo itself. So we're kind of doing a one-two punch in that particular case, making sure that the embryo stops doing what it's doing um, and that we can um, uh, have it flush out from there, so to speak. Now, what's cool about this methotrexate is that it's actually very, very good as a chemotherapy agent. No surprise that it also works on a fetus because it's also very rapidly dividing as a cell. Um, 
as a collection of cells. And that's typically what these chemotherapy drugs target, is rapidly dividing cells. Now, we also have the final option here, um, mifepristone combined with the uh, misoprostol. This is kind of taking a different angle. It's, it's, it's more targeting the hormones that are involved in this whole process. Because we kind of need progesterone to maintain the integrity of the placenta, which of course maintains the integrity of the embryo. At this first stage, once again, this is, this is all before um, nine weeks. At this first stage of a pregnancy, all of the progesterone is being produced by this thing called the corpus luteum. It's kind of a uh, leftover cyst, so to speak, uh, from the uterus. It's kind of left over after an egg is released from the uterus. It just becomes a progesterone-making factor. It's that progesterone that signals the placenta to maintain itself, to grow, to proliferate, which allows the embryo to grow and proliferate. Uh, proliferate. So if we block that progesterone, boom, we've all of a sudden killed the input signal to the placenta, placenta dies down and can basically um, flush out of the uterus from there once we add the misoprostol uh, to that to initiate the labor part. Nice thing about this particular option down here at the bottom, it seems to be better than any of the previous options. Uh, a little bit less toxic, a little bit safer. Uh, so this is typically what we resort to if we're going to do the medical uh, induced abortion option. Now, later on in the pregnancy, we can theoretically still use a medical option. <coughs> About 10 to 36 weeks, we can still use drugs to induce an abortion. It's not the most ideal. Um, it's not often used, about 1% or less of all abortions. But there you have it. And it's basically the same type of thing. We're trying to induce that labor process to basically um, expel the fetus along the way. Now we run into the two different surgical procedures. First one, um, we're going to be talking about kind of the vacuum uh, type of abortion. And that's, that's really only something you can do in the first part while the fetus is very small. Uh, fetus or embryo, I should clarify, is kind of a, a wide span in weeks there. And with that, we're basically just inserting a tube attached to a vacuum of some kind and removing all the tissue um, in the uterus. With the surgical abortion that's a little bit more physical, that's where we see something kind of akin to what we just saw in the miscarriage. Okay. In this case, we're calling it dilation and evacuation. It still involves the same DNC process, but we're also coupling it with a couple other things. We're also using a little bit of vacuum, and we're also using um, certain surgical tools like forceps along the way. What's nice is, is that this surgical option is actually much safer than the chemical option at this particular stage of pregnancy. Okay, so from 13 to 24 weeks, it's much safer to do a d &E than to try to take drugs. And if we look at the overall success rates of all these different types, we see that surgical is actually 4% higher of the success rate overall than the medical uh, or drug-induced options. So about 99%, which is pretty good. Just going to tackle some myths and misconceptions about some of this stuff. Uh, first off, I've heard that the fetus feels no pain. This is kind of a complex, convoluted topic, uh, so I'm only going to briefly kind of cover it here for you. But the general premise is, is that if if you can't see it outside of the body, it's kind of hard to determine if it feels pain or not. So we have to use some other metrics here. And one of the metrics that we can use is looking at the development of the nervous system of a fetus at that particular stage. So if we're looking at uh, a fetus that's 26 weeks um, along, like this particular one here, then yes, they have a complete neuroatomical system, anatomical system, uh, that's very good at transferring uh, nerve signals as it relates to pain. Absolutely. Now, some people kind of debate this here um, as far as how functional or relevant this system is. 
Uh, one particular person in particular says that uh, you kind of need the conscious experience of being out of the womb, of experiencing the environment, um, to really understand pain, in order to kind of learn what pain is. Uh, and so they kind of concluded that by this line of reasoning, fetuses cannot feel any pain because you need some sort of learning what pain is, so to speak, um, outside of the womb in order to really be able to cognitively think about what that is. So, a little bit of this and a little bit of that for this particular topic. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that, I, I, I guess the question is, it's feeling pain, so you're obviously saying that if it's exact 26 weeks, it, it's feeling some sort of sensation even though it doesn't understand it. Do we have any understanding if it's a sensation of positive or negative? I can't even really say discomfort, pain, not liking, just positive or negative. Right. Do, so do they... What they're, what they're kind of getting at here is that the pain receptors themselves are working. <coughs> the wiring is in place to transfer that signal to the brain. The question is whether the brain can interpret that signal as pain. That's okay. the question. So it's something in the something in the brain is firing, but the brain isn't exactly sure if it's pain or not. It's just okay. So it it doesn't even quite know yet. Yeah. Okay. So so we're still trying to figure this this kind of topic out. We have a little bit on one side of the equation and a little bit um, a few people on the other side of the equation. Then. Another thing that I, I, I seem to get this, this gist of when people are talking about abortion is that this stuff happens all the time, right? So we're having uh, people wait until the last minute, all of a sudden decide, oh, well, um, I really don't want this baby, so I'm 33 weeks pregnant, um, I'm going to go and get an abortion. That's extremely rare, extremely rare, okay? Only 1.3% of all abortions occur after 21 weeks. The majority are all within that first trimester, 91% in that first trimester. So even just looking at from this perspective, I mean, we're, we're kind of interested in where these guys are going um, from this particular point here. So we're looking at basically miscarrying before we get terribly long in development, more often than not. The other thing is this notion that people are doing more and more abortions all the time. And the truth of the matter is, the past, what is this, a, ten, a nine year span, we've seen nothing but a decrease in not only the number of abortions, but in the percentage of abortions over time here in the US. And in fact, 2012, was the lowest percentage rate that we have had uh, where did I say that? since 1973. Okay. Having 1.32% of abortions uh, along the way. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. Pretty amazing. Also, we've had a decrease in the number of abortions compared to live births. Okay. So more people are choosing to have kids and not aborting along the way. So all these different metrics are decreasing over time. Is that, you say the word choosing, but it's just out of curiosity, is that the case or is it just the laws are making it harder? And, or we just simply so say the fact that question. the that's ratio has changed? Okay. Yeah. yeah, sorry, <laughs> you're, you're right. I, I should watch my wording here. A little philosophical. Uh, let me do okay. Abortion is actually relatively safe. Okay. It's not the most dangerous thing in the world. In fact, it's actually a lot safer than actually going through with having a kid. About 14 times safer, in fact. So if we look at how many people died in 2011 from abortion, there were two. How many people died from having kids, actually going through with parturition? 700. That's pretty somber. Is that in the US? That's in the US. So we can calculate kind of these values here and show that yes, by having an abortion, you're actually 14 times less likely um, to die as a result of that particular procedure. 
The other thing that people are concerned about is whether abortion causes infertility. And the fact of the matter is, is that so long as we don't have some sort of complicating infection, there's no difference. No difference in fertility before or after an abortion. Also, we see other things like miscarriage, birth weight. Those things are also unaffected by an abortion on future pregnancies. Another thing that we can look at is breast cancer. There's no impact between abortion and breast cancer either. Now, there is a side note here, kind of going off on a little bit of a topic here, because for some reason, we, we've seen this correlation that the more menstrual cycles a woman has, the uh, greater her risk is for breast cancer. So women that start menstrual cycles earlier in life, that end later in life, they have a higher risk for breast cancer. So one could extrapolate that if you have an abortion, you're actually going to be affecting this somehow. Because having an abortion could impact how many menstrual cycles you have. So maybe that matters, maybe that doesn't. But really, the truth of the matter is that we haven't seen any direct link between the two. But so does pregnancy and breastfeeding affect how many menstrual cycles you have? Ah, they have seen um, that breastfeeding also reduces the chances right. for breast cancer. Yeah. But it also reduces the number of menstrual cycles you have, mm -hmm. typically. Yep. So that's the thing. There's so many different factors that we're trying to look at and trying to piece them all apart. So for every pregnancy, that would be a year of not having, if you breastfed mm -hmm. three months, that would be a year of not having menstrual periods. Yep, that's right. So, so let's have more kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I saying? Uh, okay, so I, I guess the only the only little bit of data that kind of goes against that is that if a mother has a child after the age of 30, then her chances of getting breast cancer actually increase. Okay, so um, fewer menstrual cycles is great, but if you're trying to do the fewer part um, after 30, that's when it can actually work against you, um, more so than you would see a benefit. Also, we don't necessarily have a whole lot of women lining up to... Um, uh, wait, or I'm sorry, we don't have a whole lot of women waiting until last minute to get an abortion by choice per se. Okay, and just have them loitering around and all of a sudden deciding at the last minute, hey, I want an abortion. There's actually 50% of them, 58% of them, that wanted to have it earlier. But for some reason, they couldn't make the arrangements, they couldn't get the money, um, they had to try to coordinate with various people, they just couldn't make it happen earlier. But they wanted to. So it, it, it's not like there's a, a vindictive side to this, per se. Uh, they, they definitely are trying to get in there as soon as they can to get this procedure done, if they end up wanting to do that. Of course, we can also tie in whether or not they know they're pregnant. Uh, that does occasionally occur. Um, and of course, just taking a while to reach a decision whether they want to have a kid or not. Another thing is <clears throat> kind of looking at the PTSD aspect of it, right? Because we hear these stories, we see these billboards that say, I regret my abortion. And you know what? That absolutely occurs. Absolutely. We're not denying that. When we did a study of 956 women, we noticed something interesting about those results, though. Okay? We asked them to... Tell us whether you thought abortion was the right decision. 95% of them said it was. A couple years later, 99% of them said it was. That's pretty high. That's not a very large percent of regret. <clears throat> and if we scored them on things like regret, on guilt, on sadness, uh, on anger, we actually saw that their average score right after having the abortion was about a 24%. So, a score from not guilty feeling, not angry, to very angry, they were only about 24%. Yeah, they're feeling something, absolutely. We scroll a few years later, 
that went down to 11%. The, it's kind of a drop in the bucket. And this is just me being kind of um, uh, relating it to one of my other topics, just to purposely go on a tangent here. Uh, I love talking about GMOs on occasion. And if we actually score people on their anxiety for these same factors, guilt, sadness, and anger, you can't have regret when it comes to GMOs. So we're ignoring that one. Um, but if you measure people on their feelings regarding GMOs in these three different factors, you find an average score of 33%. <laughs> People are more upset about GMOs than they are abortions. That's, that's kind of mind-blowing to me. So why would you want to choose abortion in the first place? You know, once again, we're talking about individual people. Okay? And an individual person's motives can be almost infinite. Right? So really what I've listed here on the screen is just what I think because I'm not a female. I've not had a kid, never going to have a kid. Uh, so this is just me kind of throwing a bunch of stuff on the board and hoping that it looks okay. All right. um, first off, I I'm just going to mention here that I do know that some mothers feel that if they know that their child is going to have some sort of lethal disorder, okay, or disorder that really negatively impacts them from having a good, positive, productive life. I can definitely see them wanting to opt to have an abortion. Okay. Tay-Sachs disease is one of those things. Okay. It is lethal and will kill that child after about five to eight years of life. Other diseases are even worse. If the kid had trisomy 18, which is three copies of chromosome 18, they can die within a year. Do you really want to put yourself and your family and that child through that pain? Some people wouldn't. So they want to have an abortion in those cases. Of course, <clears throat> being a biologist, I have to relate it to some level of biology here. Ladies, uh, I'm sorry. Some, huh? I'm sorry, ladies. I'm just going to apologize now. <laughs> just to let you know, I hid this presentation from her, so I didn't get any of her feedback. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just looking at from a biological perspective, being uh, a biologist hippie, I, I have to mention overpopulation of the planet, right? And how there's already too many of us. So I, I don't see the problem with that. Not everybody feels that way, and that's okay. Um, but we can actually get some nice numbers here. Here in the U.S., about every person on average uses, uses and puts into the air about 17 metric tons of greenhouse gases. That's pretty phenomenal. And even if you were, you know, a Prius driving, recycling, uh, composting, green person, the most green person you possibly could be, you can only get down to about 10 metric tons. Not having a child doesn't even come close to that kind of savings. Yeah. So, it really does help reduce the effects of global climate change by not having, choosing not to have a job. Not pressuring, I'm just saying these are, these are the facts here. Now, other things, as an economist, you can sit here and say, well, the more people you have, the more expensive things are, the harder things are to get, uh, and we can kind of go off on those tangents there. You know, you have to wait long lines, you get long commutes, uh, Everybody gripes about being in line for too long sometimes, whatever. Um, but we can throw in that there just for fun. Uh, but why would somebody not want to get an abortion? I would just like to add to the previous slide that like, sure. <laughs> some people might choose an abortion because they don't want to be a parent. Yes. <laughs> or financially is, they can't is, handle is, it, or they're very years. young, <laughs> career-wise. I, I love how you went through biology yeah. first. <laughs> As a point of fact, over half of abortions, women are having the abortion despite being on birth control. So in other words, 
These aren't irresponsible right. women who it's, are just stupid. The number one stupid. reason why women have abortions is because they were on birth control and their birth control failed and they ended up with an unintended pregnancy. And so that's really important. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Lines are important too. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, I'm just kind of throwing up here some, uh, some talking points. Um, so as far as not wanting to have a kid, Obviously, it just comes down to if you want to keep it. You know, if you want to keep the kid, that's fine. Of course, you want to have want to have an abortion if you want to decide to keep it. Um, and you can list off any number of other things. Uh, I do hear the argument, though, that a potential human life is destroyed. Um, and once again, that kind of comes down to well, human life is already naturally destroyed through. Miscarriage. And you know what? It's kind of impressive. There's actually a uh, group which calls themselves the, themselves Miscarriage Matters. And they're actually trying to uh, go out and seek these people that have had a miscarriage um, and help them feel better, um, comfort them in their time of uh, grief. So we at least have an avenue there for that particular uh, subset of the population there. Also, it, it might be important to mention that some people can't have kids. Right? Um, about 16% of all couples are incapable of having their own children, which is pretty high, really. I didn't think it was quite that high. So if you want to have the kid just so you can give your child and adopt it out to one of these families that can't conceive on their own, that's awesome. That's incredibly noble. I agree. And putting up with those nine months of terror, uh, just to go through with that very noble process, that's um, very brave of you. I would never do that. <laughs> Another argument that I also hear, kind of related to the every um, human life is sacred kind of thing, is that we have a unique set of DNA that's being destroyed in the process. You can make that argument, but you also have to keep in mind that unique DNA is made all the time. That's how we get cancer. Okay. Because there's been some glitch in the DNA of some cell of your body that results in a unique sequence, which is freaking out and growing out of control. So that's something to keep in mind that. So you're saying you could actually spawn Satan um, with a unique set of DNA. My mom already did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, okay, so just kind of Winding down here, we're reaching the legal side of things. Obviously, you can't have a discussion about abortion without talking about Roe versus Wade um, and how it was kind of trying to define abortion as it relates to viability. Okay. It's saying here, if it can survive outside of the woman's body um, with or without some sort of aid, then we can consider it to be viable in that um, uh, we give power to the states to ban this process <coughs> at that particular stage. Now, of course, this does allow for the exception that if the mother herself is in danger, uh, then we can actually you know, try to uh, allow her to survive by giving her that abortion if she needs it. Later on, a few years later, 1976, we have this other case, which I tried to refine this a little bit and say that, well, Viability is kind of a hard thing to define. Uh, it's kind of dependent on the, the mother um, or the expecting mother, her health, her situation. So it's kind of hard to put a, an exact figure on it, an exact cutoff point that, hey, all, abort, all uh, 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 fetuses beyond this point are viable. You can't touch them. They were saying, hey, well, it just depends on the doctor. They have to examine you and make that determination. Then, about 2003, we have this federal abortion ban enacted and subsequently supported in 2007. And this actually uh, tried to ban certain, uh, certain second trimester abortion techniques. So you can do certain things, but not necessarily other things. But it also kind of opened the door to a number of other types of legislation. And in fact, in 2011 to 2013, we had more legislation being passed 
to put some sort of constriction on abortion than we had in the previous 10 years put together. That's pretty phenomenal. And so a lot of states were kind of utilizing this opportunity to start really locking down um, on and expecting options when it came to abortion. And then I have kind of my point here, which is, what do we really call a viable embryo? It's starting to become a fuzzy line. Right? And part of this comes to the fact that we can grow embryos for 13 days in a lab in the test tube. Now I say 13 because we, we can't go up to 14. Uh, at least in Britain they can't uh, due to uh, uh, that being outlawed. And then, like I said earlier, we can actually save a 22-week-old fetus. So, if we can get the first two weeks, if we can get any point from this week's on, all we have to do is close that gap. Right? And then, anything is viable at any time. And that's kind of what we're trying to get at here. We're actually developing these artificial wounds. So we're kind of picturing something like sci-fi, right? Like uh, maybe the Matrix or something, right? We have uh, babies being grown in these, these pods or capsules, so to speak, to where they're kind of washed over in this artificial um, uh, amniotic fluid and where they can get the nutrients that they need uh, in a way that actually <coughs> permits them to survive. You can also think about how we're advancing our cell culture techniques where we can actually keep um, a, a, a simulated placenta in a cell culture dish and be able to nu uh, uh, give nutrients to the baby through some sort of umbilical cord. Obviously, we're going to have to rely on the uh, embryo transfer technology, but hey, we can do that. We're getting to the point where we can do that. So we're kind of moving in this direction towards this, this ectogenesis we call, which is where we can start putting babies in these completely artificial environments, growing them up without any need for a natural mother. Once we hit that stage, then definition of viable kind of goes out the window. Because at any point it's viable. So we're getting there. We're getting there. Just some uh, just to wrap everything up for you. Um, uh, just a few notes here about pro-life. Um, we'd strongly encourage pro-life to take into account all forms of life. Right? Because all forms of life are cells. And really we need to think about more than just uh, the parent of the Pro-choice. Pro-choice needs to be mindful of not only the future that they can give the child, um, the quality of life that they can give that child, but also the outward um, environment planet Earth here. <coughs> but along the way, we've seen that abortion is safe, it's effective, um, it actually is on the decline, okay, for one reason or another, we don't know if it has anything to do with legislation like what we were looking at there, um, and it's not necessarily something that's going to traumatize a massive amount of people that undergo it, okay, it's very, very small impact emotionally on them. Uh, also, abortion is a better option than going through with having a kid. Um, because even if you do have a kid and you have it be the greenest child on the planet, it still will put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere than not having a kid. So, if you have to have a kid, um, just keep that in mind. Choosing against having an abortion is fine. That's okay. Especially if you're trying to, you know, like I said, donate that kid to another family that can't have a child. And then we just talked about the, the viability question there at the bottom as well. So, with that, I will ask if you have any questions. Thank you so much. I just had a question about... Um, when you were talking about why some people wouldn't want to choose abortion, um, you mentioned that that a potential human life is destroyed. And I guess I guess I'm a little confused because at the beginning you you defined what life is, 
right? Um, and then you went through like the embryology stuff. So, um, so like at, at one point, at what point, like, are, are you saying that there's a potential human life there? We we know it's life, right? From what you said. Okay, so at what point does it change from be coming, so it's a potential human, at what point does it change between being a potential human and an actual human? Is there, can we define uh, that? That's where there's a gray area. Honestly, right, so, so that gets at the part that I was intentionally leaving out of this presentation, <laughs> okay? Because we could sit here and debate about that all night long. But, like, can we, can we determine whether, um, whether the embryo or the fetus is of the species Homo sapiens? Like, well, I mean, um, the hair follicles of the species Homo sapiens. Yeah. Right. So you, it's a bit more complicated than does it have human DNA. Yeah. So. Yeah, but, but there's a difference between a part of a human like your hair, or a human, and can we can we determine whether it's I would say or I would say that there's a philosophical difference between what is biologically human and what is philosophically a person. Right. And that's what Chris was leaving out of the presentation. Yeah. Everybody agrees that a fetus, a, a cell, a sperm, an egg, that those are all elements of humans, but whether they're all persons is a discussion that was outside the scope of. So we can agree that they are uh, not potential human life, but of human life. It may not be a person, but it's a human life. Well, then you have to just talk about what are the characteristics of life. That was right. one of Which the more important what, what things. He was talking about. But what point does a fetus actually start generating its own metabolism can survive without any aid or anything you know when does um a group of cells that have um <clears throat> I mean, when, when does a group of cells that are linked with the species homo sapien become a non-parasite but actually a creature uh, a human that can function on its own and that's when we get into the idea of viability. That's really the big question of abortion or not abortion is, when is a baby a baby and not a group of human cells? And like he said, at, um, <clears throat> what was it, 22 weeks, it's technically, it's not functional outside the womb, but we can save it with extensive aftercare. Or 13 days, we can actually grow it. And so that viability starts to shrink, but we, we're not allowed to grow babies. So you're yet. saying, is that like a quality of the life part or a quality of the human part? What's your definition of life? Well, I was just going off of what he was giving us for life, because he didn't talk about the viability as part of the life. That's the, uh, but a baby doesn't really generate its own metabolism. It doesn't really generate or use energy or create and lose energy, because energy, as we all know, cannot be created or destroyed. So when does that baby start fitting into the cycle? And when does that baby start hitting all of the characteristics of life? It's I not think, really... I think, I, I'm going to stop you right here. Um, I think one of the fundamental parts that we're getting to is, is a virus living? Technically, no. Right. Because it doesn't fit all of those criteria I put up in so, And so the question with regard to your question is at what point does the fetus cross that line from really being not able to fit all those characteristics of life to being able to meet all of those characteristics of life because that's the question that you're asking mm -hmm. I just I guess I was confused because I thought at first you were saying that the, that they did meet all these characteristics of life and that's the thing with multicellular organisms it becomes complicated Right? So, my brain can function just fine, but it kind of doesn't have the ability to function by itself. It's living, but it kind of needs a stomach to provide it with nutrients, kind of needs all these other things, kind of needs lungs to provide it with oxygen. So, sure, every cell in my body is alive. But because we're a multicellular organism, we kind of need all the cells working together to produce and maintain life, per se. So it sounds like you're saying, though, that then we're not human unless we have all of us. No, we're not right. life. 
but there's light like in I said, every that's, cell. That's, that's, that, light. that starts to get into a philosophical area, so I, I'm, I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible. Okay. I have a question about one of the slides. Sure. So, um, Less than one percent of surgical abortions in general, or that one kind of surgery? That one kind, yes. That that was um, the the late term uh, medical abortions are very very rare, and that's because they tend to be more dangerous. Um, as I also was trying to say on this slide. So yes, thank you for clarifying. That. And we usually have to do with the endangerment of the mother being a serious enough issue. I had a question about um, like when a miscarriage happens. Like I know, like biologically, well, when it's chemically um, that the body's trying to dispose of the uh, like messed up DNA, so it's like a process of natural selection. Right. Uh, but like, what exactly happens to make those chromosomes not like the perfect copies or not the viable? Like embryo and stuff like that. That depends. Um, obviously, sometimes it's just the mix of DNA that comes from the mom and comes from the dad. Like I said, if the uh, the mother is over 45, she's going to have a huge chance of having chromosomal <coughs> abnormalities in her eggs. Uh, so, it, once those those two that once the egg and the sperm come together and they start trying to divide, they realize. Hmm, this this isn't quite working out right, and so they undergo apoptosis, kill themselves, and cease production. Yes. One thing that I was going to ask or just comment on was the fact that one of the biggest arguments against abortion that I have heard is, well, um, you can't just go around people who believe that life starts at conception, most of the people who make this argument are saying you can't go around and having, having abortions because um, that's murder. Um, and their proof for that is when a pregnant woman is murdered, it's considered a double homicide. Um, why do you think that is? I'm not sure why that is. Um, I'm thinking, is that just people being un informed or people saying I know. Yeah. Yeah. That, that kind of borders on the philosoph yeah. philosophical part so a little that's bit. People who are time. saying that's people saying life starts at conception and then or the state deciding that life started at right. conception even though the medical community might not back that up. And well we've got a lawyer here. The reason that it's murder is because certain state legislatures have enacted statutes saying it is. In other words, we're the legislature, we're going to say it is, regardless of whether it is. The common law, feticide is not recognized as a crime, period. It just, it, sorry, there's no person there. So legislatures decided we don't like that, we are going to impose our own religious belief, and we're going to say, poof, it's a crime. That's. And that, is that at any stage then? Yeah. Did that, that's not I mean, at any stage. Can, you can, so legislatures it, can do whatever they want to. They can say, you know, did, did you cut off your little finger? That, that's a felony. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, what's but wrong with that? Ring finger, not so much. Just a little finger. <laughs> Please vote this fall. <laughs> At any point during the um, at any point during the um, pregnancy, because you mentioned a really good point, some women don't even realize they're pregnant during the first trimester. So if somebody um, accidentally hits a woman who didn't even know she was pregnant, but it turns out she's pregnant, is that automatically a double homicide? That's the plot it's twist in the James Cameron movie where the father comes in with new evidence from the doctor that she just saw for a cold that, oh my gosh, she was pregnant, mm -hmm. and he gets sent away. And Indiana, on... yes. Indiana changed the law that even though the woman cannot, you know, could not even possibly know she was pregnant, you know, they go, they take the test, whoops, pregnant. That's and it depends on how good your lawyer is. 
case. If, you're, if you have a very clever lawyer, a clever lawyer is going to try and do everything that they can in the best interest of the clients. And part of that is like, oh, assaulting a woman carries this much of a charge, but assaulting a pregnant woman carries this much of a charge, I'm going to go after the higher charge because that's what's in the best interest of my client. A pregnant woman of color. <laughs> It's a double hate crime. Yeah, come on, I've made these arguments. You go for the sympathy of the jury. But legislation is not based is normally not passed based on signs. They don't sit here and talk to biologists and be like, well, at what point it's personal. It's what the people vote for, it's what your congressman, what your senate's gonna Well, I was just gonna interject and I think I'm sorry, the lawyer, I don't know your name, um, hinted at this, but I'll make it more explicit, that um, feticide laws were a strategic um, change in the law that the pro-life movement sought in order to, it's sort of a, a, the thin edge of the wedge, right, in order to push um, personhood um, uh standards into our discussions of women's bodies and the law, mm -hmm. right? So it's okay. it's a way to insist upon the personhood of the fetuside. It came in the back door. Use, it's the way you do it. You back it door is a it. back door sort of yeah. route into that. And, they, yeah. and, it, and, and it's very deliberate. I mean, they will admit that that's part of their strategy. With malice of forethought. Yeah. They yeah. sat in the so smoke-filled rooms and decided. That was yeah. created that was supposedly supposed to call women, but only women. So basically, it was a law that was enacted that sees women as incubators. So the woman has more worth because she's pregnant. People without your beliefs that did not take this class make your laws. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to, the, um, to go back to the fact that so many um, abortions are spontaneous miscarriages, um, and the I guess, is that something that, um, when it comes to the law, I guess, how much, uh, like, in Indiana we had that case of like a woman being threatened with inf infanticide for having a late-term abortion, um, which people were like, uh, was it just a miscarriage? Is there, are there currently penalties for that penalize women for accidentally miscarrying if, in the eyes of the state, it's seen as an intentional abortion instead. <coughs> Strange that you should raise that. Uh, yes, but the law has been put on hold because the federal district court ruled it was unconstitutional. Okay. Uh, which was that any um, <coughs> termination of a pregnancy that didn't result in a live birth had to be reported the mother had to go arrange for a funeral at her expense. Right. Oh. Okay. So that's part of the new, uh, the new law. The yeah, it was. Okay, yeah. And it didn't matter if it was a spontaneous abortion. It didn't matter that, well, no, that, that you didn't carry it to term. And it's your fault. Well, wait, 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 what did I do? It doesn't matter. The General Assembly that is overwhelmingly male decided that was a good thing. And overwhelmingly not doctors. Apparently. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I shouldn't talk to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, what period can you detect uh, genetic abnormalities in the fetus, like um, Down syndrome or...? Theoretically speaking, as soon as the sperm and egg unite. Yeah. Because that's when the final genetic layout is put in place, and you have the ability to detect that. Yeah. Uh, just looking at your sources, I was wondering, do they compare studies, or are they just um, more like independent sources that are, for example, like showing the um, showing that there's no link in between abortion, breast cancer, um, infertility? Um, I was wondering because I know of and have researched um, several meta-analyses where it's like a study of studies, so like comparing other studies um, that are respected. Um, that show there is a very, very strong link between abortion and breast cancer, infertility, emotional, psychological harm. So I was just wondering about your sources, like yeah. how do they... And, and funny enough, I, I, think, I think this is a really hot topic because literally the sources I was looking at were the exact same type of thing. They were a more recent, uh, huge meta-analysis. In fact, I don't care if I had all my slides here, but... Um, 
Yeah. Two million women they looked at to determine that. So this was a huge meta-analysis of many different studies, many different countries, many different situations, showing that, hey, if two million women aren't having a higher incident rate, then there probably isn't a connection there. So it's not asserting it isn't, it's just that when you have two million as a sample size, that's pretty good. And that's backed by the World Health Organization. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, well thank you again for coming down today. Thank you.